Welcome back, everyone. We were in uh, James chapter one, so we'll continue from where we stopped. We saw the section uh, from verse twenty-two uh, till verse twenty-five, where we are encouraged to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. So sometimes uh, this section that james has written uh has been misused by um uh, you know religious uh, minded uh, believers uh, or it has been neglected by uh, the you know so called grace uh, believing uh, believers so uh, it, it really depends on how how people have taken it what is it saying you know it's just giving us a very practical and a very um a balanced uh, understanding of how to approach the word of god yes we are saved by grace uh, but we must also have the demonstration of the word of god through our lives which is why uh, the uh, writer james is telling the believers be doers of the word yes we are saved by grace we we are saved by faith uh, through grace but uh, we also have to live out the word of god uh, yes uh, avni so ma'am uh, just the last portion on the previous lecture when you said uh, you know double mindedness means that uh, you um, make a decision so this decision means the decision of uh, following christ it's like that decision you are talking of or it is like basically even post you take a decision and then uh, in 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 your walk with the uh, lord jesus christ uh, your day to day decision making is also covered in that so ju i'm just trying to ask double mindedness sure. in both sure. the area or uh, any one of those okay see uh, as far as becoming a believer is concerned salvation is concerned there has to be a clear cut decision a uh, true saving faith that uh, jesus gives us so when a believer is born again they are born again so there's nothing double minded over there we have received uh, the the saving faith which was provided and the believer is now born again okay so you cannot be if you are double minded you can't uh, really receive christ uh, you you as far as salvation is concerned if someone is double minded they generally stay out of salvation now once we have received christ and we have become believers this is more what i was talking about is more applicable to us as believers so a double minded man is unstable in all his ways as i clarified this is not referring to the process of gaining faith because in the process of gaining faith we all overcome our doubts we all slowly you know we graduate to that place of faith uh, so that's okay that's normal there's no problem with that uh, that's the usual process but double mindedness as i was telling shri kumar it's a state of mind it's it's a uh, a problem of the will where an individual is not able to take a clear cut side that okay i'm going to do this so as you mentioned of the day to day life where we are not making decisions we are sitting on the fence we know as as we pray and seek god and all we know what god is leading us to but you know when we make a decision we have to take responsibility for it so you know some people prefer to just sit on the fence and not take responsibility so that is what james is talking about over here yes ma'am so uh, basically we mean that uh, walking by the we make a decision to walk by the spirit or by the flesh huh. not yeah. uh, you know yes being uh, lazy about things and ha. knowing the truth but not doing something to follow it correct or if okay. you want to look at it in a simplest way not making a decision that's also a decision no okay <laughs> yes ma'am thank you got it okay sure sure yes yeah thank you thank you for that uh, question so we must be uh, uh you know be beware of this state of double mindedness uh, it will impair our progress in the christian journey and life in general uh, yeah 
okay so that's enough said about uh, double mindedness we uh, were talking about being doers of the word of god and not just hearers and here you know, he very uh, interesting actually like we could dwell on it for so long he says deceiving yourselves so uh sometimes you know putting in the word of god listening to the word of god you know like knowledge puff it up uh we we read about that we somewhere develop this this mentality where okay i know a lot of the word um uh, and that is enough and that gives us a false sense of um uh, you know walking walking uh, perfectly with god because uh, we we just satisfy ourselves by hearing the word but there are two aspects one is to hear and one is to do now if a believer is only a hearer i'm not talking about you know those who are hearing and who are sincerely trying to uh, put it into practice in their lives it's not referring to that but the kind of believers who are satisfied with knowing a lot of scripture we know all the scriptures but that's about it nothing else it it never translates to life and actions uh he actually it's a warning it's a very strong thing that he's saying here he says deceiving yourselves self deception uh where we have a false sense of uh, you know a secure walk with god that's so dangerous uh and we must stay out of it uh and you know self deception is kind of also the error that lucifer fell into where uh, he had a false sense of, of grandeur about himself and he just got stuck in it he was not able to see the light that no i'm actually created and i'm here to worship uh, god so self deception is a very dangerous place to get into and uh, james is actually warning he's saying if there's any believer uh, is only a listener of the word and not a doer of the word then there is that danger of coming to that place of uh, deceiving ourselves nobody is deceiving us we are deceiving ourselves so we got to be careful about that uh so he moves on he explains that further he says that uh, anybody who just hears the word and they don't do it uh, they are equated with somebody who is observing his face in a mirror observing is more than just seeing you know the the kind of language that's used there is uh, you uh, you properly consider you observe you notice okay what is right what is wrong with the way you you appear when you look uh, into a mirror but uh, if one notices what is uh, not in place and lets it go uh, uh, or forgets hey you, my my uh, face is in washed or my hair is uh, unkempt he doesn't even remember it looks at the mirror and forgets it how is it helpful to even have looked at the mirror so in the same way uh, uh, engaging with the word of god should be life changing now if it's not changing our lives or if it's not transforming the person that i am to make me more like jesus then something is wrong with the process that i am following so it's it's more like what he said earlier you are hearer but you're not a doer just deceiving myself where i feel yeah but i i know so much scripture uh, but no transformation so that's that's not uh, a godly way of uh, living so uh, he moves on verse 25 he says but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty in incredible he says perfect law there's law also there's liberty also so uh, what is it see basically under the new covenant new covenant we are now free Uh, because of what jesus has done we've been uh, delivered from sin the consequences of sin so that's why he's calling it liberty but also law because we are still under a covenant a new covenant that's what uh, uh, so he says basically when you look into the word you look into what the word has to offer and you continue in it and you're not forgetful here but you apply it uh, and and you let you engage with the word in real life this one will be blessed in what he does so actions are also important so faith is important actions are also very very important now uh, he goes ahead and remember he is talking mainly to a jewish audience 
okay because the gentiles are just about the communities are just about uh, uh, growing so uh, he is talking about being religious in the next section verse 26 if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart this one's religion is useless so uh, the jews in judaism obviously they had so many practices which made them feel good made them feel so close to god but he is warning them and he's saying See, we are so good for the jewish believers we're so good with all our uh, uh, you know day-to-day uh, uh, rituals and uh, we are good at picking off the requirements uh, but then he points to other practical aspects in a believer's life he says you're keeping all the uh, rituals the traditions how about managing the tongue or the words that we speak you know, people who don't have control uh, on on what they speak you know, we end up uh, saying wrong things we end up hurting people um, and all that he says what kind of religion is that again he uses the term deceives his own heart so he's warning the believer of self-deception he says you know it's like again we said double-minded but this is more like a double uh, 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 I, I don't know the right word to use but there's no integrity uh, because there is one side of us which is yielding seemingly yielding to god's word but there's no reflection in real life so here religious practices are there but the same so-called pious believer is speaking things which are dishonoring to the lord so uh, maybe there were things going on in the church where you know people were uh, uh, losing control of their words and so james had to address this matter but he teaches them what is the right uh, form of uh, being religious he did not stop them from uh, following a disciplined life towards god uh, because he understood that's their devotion to god but he teaches them the right way to do it so about the tongue we will come back he'll talk more about it later uh, but right now he tells them that uh, if you really want to be godly through your uh, traditions and actions then do this this is unpure and undefiled religion before god and the fa uh, father what is it our faith should translate into uh, uh, you know uh, charitable deeds through the life of a believer so what are these some charitable deeds you visit the orphans and widows in their trouble so he's saying look how can we call ourselves religious when we are not meeting needs of people around us so he's awakening them and remember he's already discussed about rich poor because there are all sections of people coming to know christ and uh, he wants them to uh, grow in unity he wants them to honor one another so there were needs in the church uh, earlier in acts we saw how people were even selling their own goods and helping one another but maybe uh, the needs have increased now or uh, don't know whether people are just caught up uh, with themselves that he's having to address this matter and he says religion is not about just fulfilling uh, you know duties before the lord but you let that faith translate into compassion and charitable deeds so specifically here he says uh, have you considered the orphan have you considered the widow people who need help people who don't have in in that community you know, these people were uh, were uh, sort of looked at as helpless those days and so that's why he's making a mention but we take it as um, uh, yes this category but in general people in need whoever is in need uh, whoever is in trouble we must help them and he says that uh, and keep oneself unspotted from the world also godly living you know, righteous living is important that's when we can truly say that uh, we are living the word of god Okay, so that's uh, James chapter 1 for us. Uh, if you're all okay, then I'll just jump to James chapter 2, uh, uh, unless there's some particular subject that you want to dwell on a little more. Are we good? Okay, sure. 
fine. So then uh, uh, let's move ahead. We are now looking at James chapter 2 here. And uh, let's see the different sections that he's going to address. Uh, could I request okay let me do this i think uh, reading sections is better because then our uh, concentration uh, we'll be able to grasp more so how about uh, one of us reads uh, from verse 1 to verse 9 verse 1 to verse 9 of james chapter 2 my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing fine clothes, and say to him, you sit here in a good place. And say to the poor, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of his kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? but you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as thyself. You do well, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sayyid. Uh, so as we can notice, uh, he is addressing partiality, uh, noticing that the composition of the congregation is swiftly changing. So uh, he is already introduced to us two sections of their community, which is uh, some people who are rich, some people who are uh, poor. Um, and uh, of course, we, we know that there were also other uh, classifications. Maybe there would have been, uh, you know, people from other uh, backgrounds like the Gentiles were joining. There was differences in the gender, ages. So. Uh, uh, people from uh, different regions joining together in worship. But overall, what James is saying is as the, as the church is growing, uh, equality among the believers from the spiritual point of view is very key. Uh, so here he uh, says, uh, and uh, he's likely addressing the leaders, uh, you know, more than the the believers you could say so he he says something like uh, if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings so gold rings it is uh, said that in the times uh, when james wrote this it was a it was a sign of richness so uh, people would would like to boast of their wealth uh, by the number of rings uh, that they had so that that identification uh, is talked about here of fine apparel uh, and uh, when a poor person comes, obviously they don't have these things, and so filthy clothes is their description. But he's really uh, saying, uh, look, if you pay attention to the rich person, because it's noticeable that they are rich, and uh, you give them a better place in the meeting or in the assembly, um, you have demonstrated partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts so uh, that's self-explanatory you know we all understand bias partiality and now it's happening in action so uh, verse 5 onwards he states has god not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him so now when we read this particular verse somewhere there is this interpretation that uh, the poor of the world um, 
are rich in faith. So, uh, because, you know, the, there was that statement that Jesus made about a rich man, uh, that uh, it's easier for, uh, what was that? Uh, to enter the eye of, uh, a camel to enter the eye of the needle than uh, a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So, somewhere people use that and they say that, so richness of faith is possible if you are economically poor. Uh, and uh, uh, if you have money, then, uh, then you can't have richness of faith. But that's not the interpretation of this. So how much money we have, that's uh, not a determinant of uh, how much faith we can carry. Uh, so that shouldn't be interpreted that way. Basically, what he's saying is the poor can be rich in faith just like everyone else can be rich in faith. Okay, So it's not exclusive to the poor person and uh, in continuation he says heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him so the poor can be heirs of the kingdom just like everyone else can be heirs of the kingdom so we shouldn't make it sound like only if you are poor you can have these things that's not uh, what it's saying uh, verse 6 but you have dishonored the poor man so obviously he's saying partiality is not good. You cannot dishonor a brother uh, on the basis of his background. And in this case, money. Uh, and then he says, do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts. So uh, he is likely talking about some of the incidents that have happened. We know that uh, the Bible also says that you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. So maybe there were some people uh, in the in the congregation or the assembly who had this attitude that they loved money so much that they oppressed people. They were willing to fight to maintain their position, uh, maintain their wealth. So he's talking about some people. Now, generalizing it and saying, oh, all rich people oppress uh, you see, even having wealth is a blessing from God. We know that. And it's God who blesses us. Uh, he, he's the one who gives us the power to get wealth, the Bible says. And so uh, we, we are not here to discriminate just as much as we are saying, okay, don't put the poor down. We say, okay, even richness shouldn't be uh, a determinant in the house of God to how you know one must be treated. We're all the same. Uh, and uh, verse 7, uh, do they not blaspheme that noble name by which uh, you are called? So he's saying um, uh, the rich who, who do these things are putting uh, God down. So verse 8, if you really fulfill the law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So uh, quite clear cut. We shouldn't have any partiality. Uh, and in this particular case, between the rich and the poor. So let's read uh, from verses 10 to verse 13. Verse 10 uh, some, verse yeah. Yes, Mangi, please. For whosoever shall keep the world low and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of law. So speak, and so does those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who was shown no mercy. Mercy triumph, triumph over judgment. Okay, thank you, Bangi. So here in this section, uh, we uh, see how it's important to keep the whole law. Um, and of course, you know, we know that uh, uh, this was what came in through the old covenant, the law, and then people tried to keep it. But thank God, uh, God's grace uh, came upon us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, verse 12, he says, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. So he is calling us more to walk 
in that grace in uh, that understanding of the new covenant uh, where you know there is mercy which uh, triumphs over judgment so basically uh, walk in grace extend uh, mercy yeah and if we don't ex extend mercy we cannot expect mercy to be extended to us he puts it uh, in that manner uh, let's read from verse uh, 14 to verse 19 shall i read ma'am yes Amni. james chapter 2 verse 14 to 19 what does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works can faith save him if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and i will show you my faith by my works you believe that there is one god you do well even the demons believe and tremble amen amen thank you avni so uh, once again a section which is concurrent with what we saw in uh, james chapter one where he says that uh, uh, faith is important but then works you need to demonstrate that faith that faith should be evident uh, through our lives so same thing here he says if someone says he has faith but does not have works can faith save him so we must be doers of the word uh, and when we are doers of the word uh, doers is what it's referring to works the works that come out of our lives uh, and you know he he is not saying here that we must work to earn our salvation you know this question this question is settled uh, and we know so many passages in scripture where uh, we understand that it's not through our works but it is through uh, the redeeming work of the lord jesus on the cross of calvary that we are saved we are born again so is james trying to say that we must work for our salvation not at all that's not the point that he is making but he is saying that when we are saved when one is saved there must also be actions uh, you know al along the lines of our faith so that's what he's saying these two things are not separate um so if let's say somebody states that they only have faith and they don't have corresponding action so in verse 17 he makes the statement he says faith by itself if it does not have works what is it it is dead it is dead so faith should translate into actions and then again he gives one example simple example of actions here that he gives us uh, meeting the needs of people there are people with practical difficulties practical challenges what is good you know if we just uh, bless them pray for them do all this so-called spiritual activity but don't do anything practical to meet the need in those moments uh, that also is like dead religion so he says let your uh, actions go along with your faith uh, and these two things are not separate. So verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. So these two things are not separate. Both have to be there in the life of a believer. Uh, so only believing is not uh, helpful. So, you know, he uses this example where he says, even the demons just believe. Uh, they also believe that there is a God, they tremble, but they are demons, isn't it? So what comes out of them, the actions, oppression, uh, wickedness. So just 
stating that we believe is not enough but what we do is um, an identifier of you know whether we are born again or not okay uh, so again i'm not saying that our works will win our salvation but then uh, it's like fruit the fruit is a good way of explaining this when one is born again the works should be able to uh, show that this person is born again okay let's go to the section from verse 20 to 26 any any doubts any questions about what was said Sir, Pastor, from 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 which verse? Okay, you can read uh, from twenty to twenty six, please. Twenty to twenty six. Yeah. But do you want to? Uh, but do you want to know, O oh, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by work and not by faith only. Likewise, was not to have the hallowed or also justified by work, by work when he received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without work works is dead also. Thank you, Pastor. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh... Mangi. So here, in line with what he has been saying, he's been saying that uh, faith without works is dead. So he brings up two examples. And he talks about Abraham first and then Rahab. Uh, he says that uh, Abraham, we know that he believed God. And believing God was uh, accounted to him or credited to him as righteousness so the first thing is belief faith he's the father of faith that's how we look at look at him abraham he's our role model our example about faith uh, now yes he had faith but you notice verse 21 was not abraham our father justified by works when he offered isaac his son on the altar so we can't stop with saying that Abraham had faith in his heart, but his life, his actions showed the faith that he had. So what, what uh, did he do? He trusted God. He waited for the birth of Isaac. Uh, then when Isaac was born and he came into this test where he was asked to sacrifice Isaac, he took that step. He offered Isaac. How could he offer Isaac? He believed God. You know, in other pas passages, Hebrews 11, we saw how Abraham even believed that if God needed to raise him from the dead, he would do it. So it's because of the faith that he carried that his actions followed. He went ahead to offer his son Isaac. So here, James is trying to show us, see, faith is not separate from our actions. If we have faith, then our actions will follow uh, and that's how abraham too he was accounted uh, with righteousness for what he believed but he was justified by the works when he offered up isaac so there is faith there are works as well and uh, we must remember that and as we continue in this way, he uses terminology, verse 22. You see that faith was working together with his works. And by works, faith was made perfect. So how is faith made perfect? Well, the point is, 
the maturing. The maturing of oneself in their faith towards God um, works are connected to that, uh, and we must we cannot neglect works and only hold on to uh, you know just believing in the heart is sufficient sort of a uh, uh, mentality. Now another example which he has here is that of Rahab, and uh, he see he says how her works also justified her. Obviously, she believed in the God of Israel and uh, she uh, trusted that there will be protection for her and her family. So there is faith in her heart. But verse 25, also justified by works. So she did something about her faith. What did she do? She received the messenger. She protected them. She sent them another way. So she did something to demonstrate her faith. So he is uh, encouraging the believers. First, you talked about equality, no partiality. Now the theme is let works accompany our faith because both are important. And uh, in order to make us understand how the connection is uh, so necessary, he gives this example. Verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead also. So you see, that's where he's coming with, with this concept of dead. Your faith is dead. Uh, so uh, faith without works is dead because a body without the spirit is dead. So the connection is somewhat like that. And we must not consider these things separate from each other. All right, so let's now move on to James chapter 3 here. Uh, could somebody please help in reading from verse 1, maybe verse 1 and 2, and then we'll go ahead. Verse 1 and 2. My brethren, let, let, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that, well, that uh, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many things. If any anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to be bridal the whole body. Okay, thank you, Mangi. So here there is a word of caution uh, to those who want to become teachers. Uh, and James says that let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. So basically what he's saying is that um, the way, um, you know, teaching works in the kingdom of God is that uh, there is a huge responsibility, um, you know, on, on the shoulders of a teacher because Jesus said, Matthew 5, 19, that um, when one whoever uh, breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven but whoever does and teaches them he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven so there's responsibility one is to ourselves live by higher standards okay uh, because the judgment is going to be stricter as verse one says uh, and the other thing that uh, it states here is when we teach people you know, that we teach accurately, that they can also follow the right standards of God's word. So one is to live out, do, and then you teach. Uh, and that's the right way of uh, be, being a teacher and becoming a teacher. And verse 2, he says, uh, again, you see how there's a, uh, you could say there's a disconnect, but then uh, if you talk along the lines of teaching the word, then you can connect the next section that is about the tongue and uh, uh, the words that one speaks. So in verse 2, uh, the focus comes to the words that we speak. Okay, So he says, we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. So what is perfect here? Perfect, again, referring to maturity, full grown, uh, something like an adult, 
right uh, in in uh, their walk with the lord uh, grown up basically so who is mature you know an individual who can control uh, their words or they have self control as far as speaking words is concerned so if we can bridle the tongue or we can regulate our words by ourselves then such a person is mature as a believer that's what uh, james is saying uh, let's uh, continue he's he's going to say more about our words from verse 3 to verse 6 please verse 3 to verse 6 yes indeed we put bits on in horses mouths that they may obey us and we turn their whole body look also at ships although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things see how great a forest see how great a forest a little fire kindles and the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity the tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell thank you thank you say a very touchy subject very close to uh, all of our hearts uh, the matter about the tongue and the words that we speak so james is helping us understand the power of the words uh, so he gives us this analogy of bits in horses mouths uh, what happens is when uh, people want to control uh horses and you know they want to direct horses they use these bits so as you you kind of you know move it uh you can uh lead them in a certain particular path similarly rudders of ships okay a pilot would uh, use that to move the ship uh in the direction that he wants to so he's saying that the tongue is like that regulator you know it it uh, it's a very small member it he says tongue is a little member but it boasts great things it can lead our lives it can give direction to our lives that's the point it can control many other things in our lives so uh we must be very careful about the words that we speak now he says see how great a forest a little fire kindles so again he is comparing the tongue to a little fire which can burn down the forest uh, so that is the power of the tongue so it's something like you know the controls are in the tongue for greater things uh, like if you just want to imagine Uh, we all have homes and we have these main uh, electrical uh, switches isn't it so when you put it on the whole house has electricity but when you put it off the whole house loses electricity so something like that so the controls are up here the words we speak that's what he's talking about and he says and the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity the tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell so depending on the words that we speak you can imagine uh if we speak he's talking this particular verse he's saying in the negative context he's saying let's imagine we speak words of death you know words of discouragement words of cursing all the wrong things which is not aligned to uh, uh, god's nature he says it is set on fire by hell so that's how the tongue will be that kind of a fire what will it do it will burn down the forest it will burn down the house but when when we remember that 
yes this kind of control lies with my tongue and we we turn it around you know verse six if we flip it around and we let's say uh it, not a world of iniquity but then we use our tongue as a source for speaking righteous things then what happens we can reap the blessings that come out, out of it as well isn't it so we can speak life we can speak uh, uh blessings we can speak hope we can speak uh, encouragement we can speak uh, words of prophecy the goodness of god coming forth into people's lives into our own lives into our own families so uh, he say he's trying to awaken the believers to the power of the tongue and just the way you know we can talk so much about this the way god created the heavens and the earth with the words of his mouth uh, he's letting the believers know god has given as such an amazing capability with the tongue and so let's be mindful of the words that we speak okay uh, so we are in continuation of the tongue subject of the tongue but i noticed the time is already 10:50 uh, so no worries uh, in the next class uh, what i'm thinking is hopefully we shall finish the book of james and uh, maybe uh, uh you know i'll see if uh, we should start uh, from peter or uh, just do uh, jude that way we would have tackled three books and then just two more to go in the coming month of april so anyway let's um, pray now and we shall close uh, but i hope you are you're doing okay or do you do you feel this is uh, sort of rushed I wish we had an extra month but we will finish. <laughs> I wish too <laughs> but uh, uh, unfortunately you know we have to make do with the time that we have. Yeah but I encourage you to go back to the sermon series thankfully you have uh, the videos the notes the powerpoint and all of that. Okay so let's pray let's pray and close uh, want to request one of us to please lead in prayer. Let us pray. Yes. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for today's lesson on the book of James. And thank you for the lessons on controlling our tongue, standing in faith, not showing partiality, not giving to anger, and a host of many things, Lord, we have learned today. We pray, Father, that let the truth, Lord, that we have heard and studied, we pray that, Lord, will become an embodiment and practitioners of this truth we pray that even lord as we are being prepared and equipped to teach the truth so lord all that we are learning lord we pray that these words will not stand against us but lord will be worthy examples of all that we have been taught and all that we teach we pray for our teacher we pray for pastor nancy lord you will bless her lift her expand her continue to strengthen her in this work and pray that lord you would anoint her more and more for the task ahead oh lord we give you praise and glory we commit the next class to your hands and pray that you would give us the wisdom and the understanding lord required lord to put all that we are learning lord it's a good practice and even be people lord who will be able to expand your kingdom for your glory here on earth we pray, thank you for everything. Accept our prayers, O Lord, and say our prayers in your mercy and in your power. Thank you, everlasting Lord. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Say. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Uh, continue to grow in the word of God. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to meeting all of you next week again for our classes. God bless. Have a good weekend. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. God bless.